Okay. So uh, tonight I'm very pleased to talk about the magic of the mountains, uh, which I'm sure most of you appreciate, and their biodiversity. We're fortunate that about 25% of our landscapes in Canada and in North America are mountainous habitats, and these are composed of upper montane forest, uh, tree line, or sometimes called subalpine and alpine. And we're intrigued and we like to enjoy hiking in them, but most folks think that these are barren landscapes that are mostly rocks and ice and snow and shrubs and not very much, um, uh, not very important for biodiversity. So tonight I want to talk to you about um, the amazing biodiversity that's supported by these high mountain habitats, uh, particularly focused on British Columbia. And here we have a very self-important willow ptarmigan uh, on the Hudson Bay Mountain looking out towards the Telquas ranges and two other uh, nesting songbirds, um, horned larks and uh, juncos. So um, <clears throat> there's, um, and of course in British Columbia, some people think about 75 or 80% of the land base is mountainous in that it is over a thousand meters in elevation. I want to start by talking about just how high birds can go because the wings are a tremendous advantage in terms of being able to get you uh, up off the ground. And the world record at this point is the Rupel's vulture. It's a vulture that lives in Africa that was recorded flying at the uh, an elevation of 11,000 meters. So that's about 33,000 feet and about 2,000 meters above the highest point on earth, which is Mount Everest. Um, this data point was collected uh, because this unfortunate vulture was sucked into a jet engine uh, because they were both up in the slipstream, uh, probably for the same reason that it was a little easier to move um, through the air. And uh, so the, the vulture um, didn't uh, have a long life, but it did establish a record. Uh, so birds, uh, the more research that's being done, the more we learn about just how high these uh, birds can go, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 meters, or uh, 20 to uh, 25,000 uh, feet is, no, uh, is not unusual anymore. However, for breeding, they have to come to earth. And uh, so the highest breeding records are three Eurasian species that have been recorded breeding between 6,000 and 6,600 meters. So these are the, the lovely blue grandala there, which is a musca capidae and a snow pigeon and a Tibetan lark. So these birds um, are breeding, are laying eggs and the eggs are developing under conditions of hypoxia where uh, we would be challenged to keep our, our cells alive. And these uh, young embryos are able to develop under those circumstances. The North American records are around just over 4,000 meters or 12 to 14,000 feet. And here the species with the highest breeding records are horned larks and rosy finch and white-tailed ptarmigan. Now they're a little lower in North America because the landscape is lower simply. Uh, humans are uh, more challenged by uh, high elevation environments, more challenged by hypoxia uh, than birds because um, just over 20, um, over uh, 2000 meters or 5,500 5, feet, uh, humans start to feel the effects of high elevation. Whereas birds at 35 to 3,800 meters is where they, they have no trouble whatsoever up to that uh, point. And then they can do some uh, cellular or physiological um, sort of adjustments so that they can um, not only stay alive, but to do actual work of flying, feeding, and, uh, and developing embryos. So birds are pretty special in this regard. And uh, so I want to talk, talk first about what is a mountain, because I once gave one of these talks, and then at the very end of the talk, somebody says, well, what's a mountain? So I thought, well, I better start with that. So a mountain is a landmass arising above the general landscape that induces a change in the climate that affects vegetable and animal life. So it's mountains are generally high places, but not all high places are mountains. So you can have some high um, plateaus that are not really mountainous because they don't change uh, the climate around them. 
And uh, then for a global perspective, between uh, basically a quarter, 24 to 27% of the Earth's surface is mountainous. Uh, if you include Antarctica, uh, the continent of Antarctica, then it's 27%. So a significant amount of the Earth's surface is um, classified as mountainous. If you want to see, and it's not that easy to figure out exactly how much uh, mountain, it's not very easy to map because of all the different aspects and relief. But in our book, we basically, after a lot of different um, modeling and slicing and dicing, uh, we have this global distribution of mountains. So mountains occur on all continents. And in this case, we're uh, considering any uh, landscape where that's above 2,500 meters as, as mountainous. You don't have to worry too much about the colors on this, but anything that's kind of green or greeny blue are uh, sort of land areas that are above 2,500 meters up to over 5,000 meters. And you can see that basically the whole of the west coast of the Americas are mountainous starting in the Rockies and the coastal mountains and going down to the Andes. Uh, the Antarctic, a continent of Antarctic at the bottom is, uh, is mountainous, a fair amount of mountains. And uh, Eastern uh, Eurasia, the Alps, and then also uh, Australia and New Zealand. So uh, there's a mountains uh, throughout all the continents. Um, and um, so significant amount. And the other thing that's very interesting about mountain landscapes as opposed to say Arctic landscapes, which they're often uh, related to, is just the rad how radically different these habitats are across the different continents and uh, with latitude. So we have tropical uh, alpine or high mountains and subtropical temperate mountains, which is what we live in here in British Columbia. And then as you go uh, further north, uh, boreal mountains, which end up being lower, but basically there the tree line is lower and Arctic. So with an overall 21% uh, of um, the land base uh, in this analysis, uh, which doesn't include Antarctica, being mountainous. And off that, about a quarter of those mountains are temperate mountains which are the ones that we're living in, in Northern North America and uh, in the Southern South America. And uh, in terms of biodiversity, so far uh, we did a tally in as far as we can actually um, determine, because for many species, particularly in the tropics, these, um, these number, some of the breeding habitats are just not known. But uh, just over uh, 1,300 bird species uh, breed above tree line. So they breed at tree line or above. Um, and that represents about 12% of birds. Now, not all of those birds breed exclusively in the Alpine, only about, um, uh, about a couple of hundred species breed uh, exclusively in the Alpine, but we have many species, um, <clears throat> about 80% of the species breed across elevational gradients, so from low elevation to high. Here we have a picture of temperate mountains, more familiar to us, and uh, a picture of um, a Puya landscape. This is a bromeliad, a very um, uh, impressive bromeliad where the spikes go up to 10 meters high. So pretty impressive, very, and then very low, low vegetation. <clears throat> These um, tropical and subtropical habitats also vary quite a bit from humid, uh, you know, cloud forests and uh, wet areas to a very dry landscapes, uh, desert and shrub steppe. So there's a wide range of habitats, which is one of the reasons why we have um, such amazing uh, biodiversity. And uh, the other thing, especially in the tropics, uh, tropical alpine, they have large wetlands, large diverse wetlands that uh, support a, a huge number of species, about 40 species of water birds, some very special ones like this giant coot in the background. And then also these wetlands, these large wetland areas are also support some terrestrial species like the two birds in the foreground, the, the uh, glacier finch, which used to be called the white-winged duica finch and, the, uh, and, a seed and a seed snipe. So lots of water birds, which you might not think that much about as very strongly associated with the Alpine, but if we have any big 
lakes uh, in our temperate mountains, we also will have some water birds, a few shorebirds and a few water birds, but not quite as many as we would have in uh, tropical areas. And of course, uh, the other fairly amazing thing in the tropical alpine in the Americas, which is the only place that hummingbirds live, we have uh, 37 hummingbird species that live and breed above 4,000 meters. So uh, sort of, again, surprising. These hummingbirds are well adapted to living in very cold landscapes because if it gets really cold, they can go into a torpor. Uh, which is not quite like a hibernation, but it's a way of saving energy during a fairly cold period. So uh, it's amazing how um, these hummingbirds can handle with, with such a high metabolism that they can handle um, these uh, um, landscapes, which can be very cold below freezing at night. Um, so I'm going to talk now a little bit about what's involved in, um, in living in mountains, coping mechanisms. And uh, one of the things that um, characterizes mountains generally is they have these really strong environmental gradients. So um, for every 100 meters, you have about a 0.65 decrease in temperature or scaling that up for every kilometer, there's a six and a half degrees centigrade decrease in temperature. And as we go up in elevation, we also have a decrease in the uh, partial pressure of oxygen. So the air becomes thinner. And so at five kilometers or 5,000 meters, there's a 50% decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen. So you have to work much harder uh, to, to do the same amount of work. It takes a lot more energy to do the same amount of work. And these characteristics are similar for tropical and temperate areas. For example, uh, as comparison, which people often think the Alpine or the mountains and the Arctic are very similar landscapes, but to get an equivalent um, difference in um, temperature uh, for the Arctic, uh, say one kilometer difference, it's 90 kilometers uh, in uh, increase in latitude to get the same uh, decrease in temperature. So uh, these are, uh, mountain, these are habitats that have a lot of different uh, habitat types and environmental conditions in very close proximity. And that can be a real advantage if you need to go for cover. So for example, here, uh, if you're up in the, uh, in the shrubs in the um, uh, subalpine or the alpine and it gets a big snow squall, you can go down into cover in the forest and it's only maybe a kilometer or half a kilometer away. So that's the advantage of having a lot of different habitats compressed into a small area. Uh, so generally then, as you move from montane or a mountain forest, a closed mountain forest into an alpine, uh, conditions get more severe. And they get more severe because the habitats are more open, perhaps then increasing um, the predation risk. Uh, these habitats are characterized by high winds and arid conditions. And uh, it, particularly for uh, temperate habitats, there are can be great variations in food availability, particularly if you're an insectivore, you eat insects, then it gets cold or snow, then the insects, uh, the food disappears. Uh, for temperate areas, the breeding seasons are quite short and we have frequent events of extreme weather uh, fragmented habitats, I'll talk about that a little later, and then um, uh, hypoxia or a low partial pressure of oxygen. So the higher up you go, the tougher it gets to um, survive. And of course, the more impressive the adaptations that birds have developed to live under those conditions. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this Andean condor. It's the, um, it's the world's heaviest soaring bird. Uh, it's an alpine specialist uh, with a, wing a wingspan of three meters, and it weighs between 10 and 15 kilograms. So that's basically like a small turkey. And um, so for a bird that heavy uh, to fly at an elevation of 5,000 meters is remarkable. And this bird is able to soar for up to five hours at a time without any flapping flight. So it's able to rise up on the thermals and then just remain airborne on the thermals. And 
uh, the work that's been done looking at the energy expenditures, it only this bird only spends about one percent of its time in flapping flight, and that one percent uh, requires about twenty percent of its daily energy expenditure. So, um, so it's an alpine specialist that has um, really figured out how to glide and uh, and save energy. Um, one of the things you know, if you work in the Alpine and you get a few days like this, we call this Heidi land, you get these idyllic summer days. Uh, this is in Colorado, uh, but you just as easily could have even in the same day or certainly the next day, a snowstorm. This is a, a snowstorm on the 4th of July uh, at, on Hudson Bay Mountain uh, near Smithers. Uh, you can get whiteout conditions at any time, and then often, some years, you have greatly delayed um, uh, snowmelt. And for birds that are mostly breeding on the ground, they need snow-free uh, areas uh, in order to uh, start nesting. So they, the birds have to be very, very uh, able to handle a wide range of conditions um, from day to day and from morning to evening, as well as uh, highly seasonal variation which can happen here. These are uh, one of my study areas in Colorado and the upper left picture uh, with all the snow, that's a nice summer day, maybe early June. Uh, and then the birds that started nesting on the upper right is uh, a snowfall that happened over some ptarmigan eggs uh, on the bird left. During these periods when the snow covers most of the area, predation is often higher because all the bird, all the uh, predators have to do is just go from bare spot to bare spot. Um, so if there's a late snow, this can often cause um, a predation like failure due to predation. But in the lower right, a lot of the alpine birds are very good at re-nesting. So the lower right picture shows um, a set of eggs uh, on uh, in the re-nest, and you can see the conditions are very different. There's a uh, flush out and um, and uh, considerably more cover and considerably warmer. But these conditions, if the birds were going to wait for conditions to be uh, benevolent and um, and more predictable, they basically wouldn't use these habitats. Um, the tropical uh, alpine is a very different, it's similar in that there's a lot of variation, but the seasonal variation, the onset and the uh, cessation is not very great. There's relatively little change in the temperature uh, over time, but basically the birds that live in these kind of habitats, uh, they have to be able to deal with uh, day-night uh, climate uh, variation. So in the day, it can be uh, almost inducing heat stress. It can be 40 degrees or more. And at night, it can be freezing or uh, just above freezing. So they get that variation, that climate variation on a daily basis rather than a seasonal basis. In general, in alpine areas, uh, in the tropics, uh, the, the breeding seasons are much longer. They can be five or six months instead of just, uh, just a, a few, uh, few weeks. Uh, for many species, of course, we don't really know anything about the season and how long they breed or many other th aspects of, of their ecology. That's one big problem with, uh, with the tropical alpine birds. Uh, aside from dealing with uh, weather uh, and climate variation, and, and this weather can be precipitation as well as um, temperature, uh, alpine habitats by their nature are patchy, very patchy. And so that means that uh, particularly if we're going to move from one habitat to another uh, for breeding versus uh, post-breeding uh, and uh, winter, then you need to move across hostile landscapes. And uh, you may be able to see uh, a ptarmigan here. It's a Vancouver Island ptarmigan perched just below and to the right of the cairn. This is the highest point on Vancouver Island on the Golden Hind. And this bird is looking south at this range of mountains. Uh, when you're up at the Golden Hind, you can literally see the whole backbone of Vancouver Island on a nice day. You can just look um, sort of south, uh, southeast, uh, southwest, I guess, and you can see. Uh, so this bird is probably looking at where am I going to go? But she's certainly not going to move on a day like this. It's just too dangerous. So she would wait for a storm. 
uh, or some cloudy time or whatever. But generally, birds have to be able to move across these uh, patchy habitats. Prim this is especially for birds that live in temperate mountains. And when I talk about temperate mountains, I mean uh, mountains that are sort of our latitude or the latitude of say the Midwest uh, and to the north. So uh, highly seasonal areas as opposed to tropical areas. So about 85% of birds that uh, nest in the Alpine in the temperate area leave the breeding season or bleed the breeding area after they finish breeding. So they go to a different, uh, often a lower habitat for uh, fall and winter. Now that's in contrast to tropical uh, alpine birds where only 27% leave. So the 75% basically stay on in, the, in their habitats year round. Uh, it's considered to be risky to have to do this move, but there's very little information on this. And I, I think the birds know what they're doing. So they generally tend to go uh, to make these movements when they're not readily detected. Uh, by um, by um, predators, particularly um, um, uh, avian predators. And you may have been in the mountains some, from time to time and the cloud cover comes down and then uh, the birds just go wild. The ptarmigans start flying around. Everybody's making a lot of noise because they know that they're not going to be visible or that they're way less visible to um, to alpine predators. So uh, So it gives them kind of a release. Uh, some other adaptations for birds to survive in these areas. Uh, if you have species where there's a, several species in a genus, then the ones that are living at the higher elevations uh, are generally larger. They're a little bit larger so they can handle that. They have a better surface to volume area, area, um, area if they're a little bit larger. Uh, and they have a long square tail, which they use for stability when they're flying and, and landing. Um, so that's another general shape. And then they have, many of them will have, uh, um, the songbirds especially, a, a longer back toe or a halix. And that's used for gra grapping or gris uh, grasping uh, generally in high winds. So the birds have a different shape, uh, <laughs> which helps them to, um, to deal with the environmental conditions. And then the other, there are some behavioral things that they can do. For example, when it's colder, uh, juncos, for example, on the upper left here, the high elevation juncos uh, made bigger, bulkier nests, uh, which were better insulated as the, compared to the lower elevation birds. So the junco is one of the birds that basically nests from um, coast uh, sea level to alpine. So they're really, really high elevation. They're well adapted for it. Uh, there's also savanna sparrows, for example, use overhead cover and lots of lateral cover, particularly uh, in the direction of the prevailing winds, colder winds. Uh, some um, alpine birds nest in burrows, and in fact, these uh, 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 rose finches here um, use uh, uh, pica burrows, and sometimes these pica burrows are not quite abandoned. They will use abandoned ones, but sometimes they get a little bit stroppy, and they actually are able to um, uh, sort of harass the pica long enough for them to, to leave the, the burrow. So they will go underground. Uh, the birds that we, uh, alpine birds we watched in um, Chile, for example, which was quite interesting, they all nested underground in rocks, in rock, under rocks. So they will, they basically do things to insulate themselves and to get out of the uh, conditions, uh, the rigorous conditions. And of course, ptarmigan are well known for their adaptations to make themselves invisible. Uh, in fact, the, the this ptarmigan, uh, if the, but the only thing you can see in winter is its black uh, beak and the eye. And if you approach them in winter, they'll close uh, a membrane, a nictitating membrane on the eye down so you can't even see the eye. So all you see is this floating beak. And I don't know how well you can see it, but anyway, this is, this is the bird. 
And uh, it, so it's very, very aware of its color and the background color. So it'll always choose an area where uh, it will match its landscape. And then of course they are very uh, careful to move so that they're not, uh, they're not uh, seen. So in this ne next picture, which is kind of a variety of seasons, the red arrow shows uh, a ptarmigan, a female ptarmigan nesting. You can see she's got very, very excellent matching with her background. In fact, it's hard to tell what's her head and what's her, uh, what's her tail. <clears throat> and when you approach them, they close their eye over a little bit so that even that is less obvious. In the lower left, you've got a pair of ptarmigan that are kind of mottled. They're coming into their breeding plumage, and the background again is uh, white and um, and uh, brown. Uh, ptarmigan, of course, are one of the specialists for alpines, so they've got these snowshoes on their feet that they have in winter, so they can walk on snow and not sink too much. And then, of course, they will also use uh, uh, burrows uh, into the snow um, in. Uh, and evenings just to um, to to stay warmer. Um, <clears throat> of course, many alpine birds nest on the ground like this horned lark. Horned larks are very hardy uh, alpine songbirds. I know they nest across a variety of landscapes and also they, basically they're a bird of open habitats. But one of the habitats that they do very well in is uh, alpine habitats. And we've worked in this uh, mountain on Hud in Hudson Bay Mountain and, and just outside Smithers for I think 12 years working on um, uh, horned larks and savanna sparrows. And one of the things, they are a bigger bird and they there's not much time, so they really have to get on it. And they can nest a bit earlier because they're a little bit bigger than the savanna sparrows. But you can see in this year, which is 2017, uh, it was uh, late May and um, the snow, there's about 90% snow cover. And these three round circles here, 17 1, 17 2, and 17 3. These are the first three nests that they established in that year. So um, it's remarkable how, in fact, it's actually quite convenient because, because they start to nest early, uh, early in the season, we just go to the bear patches and look for a, a nest hole or something that they get started. And then, of course, they line it nicely and whatever. But the they really do. They're amazing in terms of how quickly they can start nesting when there's so much snow cover. I want to talk a little bit about I've done long term population studies on a variety of birds. And for this project, which took about 12, 14 years, probably at least, I wanted to look at some birds that were well adapted, uh, generalist birds, because Although there's a few specialists uh, alpine breeders, the majority of them are generalists. So they breed across wide elevation gradients. And you will know most of these species, the horned lark, the savanna sparrow, the dark-eyed junco, and the uh, Pacific wren. And uh, I want to look at whether these high elevation habitats were uh, good for them, or basically they were just up there because they couldn't get uh, a good territory lower down. So we kind of had a, a view of how well did they do over multiple years. And here's um, a graph that hopefully should be fairly simple for you to see, but the for the four species, uh, we looked at the blue, the dark blue is high elevation habitat, so 2000 meters, and the, the green is lower elevation, like 1000 meters. And you can see here that the birds that nest at high elevation have 57% less time to breed. So they only have between 28 and 40 days for which they can start uh, their nesting. Uh, so in uh, just start uh, to, to lay eggs. And comparing this to the light green, they have somewhere between 60 and 100 days. So uh, the high elevation birds don't have a lot of time and so they have to hit it. In the case of the larks, they go as soon as they can because uh, if they don't, then they run out of time. Um, and so what happens is if you look at these dark-eyed juncos where which we had a study in Jasper National Park, you can see the result was that uh, the birds at high elevation were much less productive. They only produced 
two chicks per season, as opposed to the low elevation birds, which had four and a half chicks. So the low elevation 1000 meters had double the, uh, more than double the uh, breeding success for that year. But there are some advantages to being at higher elevation in that the high elevation birds were larger and fatter. They had more fat, the young ones, and higher survival. So looks like it could be a bit of a trade-off where it's tough at high elevation. You have less time and fewer chances to, to try to produce a brood, but you end up with higher quality offspring at the end of the day. And uh, the other advantage as well is that the, the high elevation, so these are the dark blue, have high, had higher survival, about 18 to 20% uh, percent higher survival than the low elevation. So uh, fewer young, uh, but higher quality young and uh, adults that live longer. So you kind of are moving from uh, a slow lifestyle to a fast lifestyle. So I kind of uh, take this uh, little graphic here and show that the, up on the upper left, you've got the high elevation and the lower uh, lower elevation is uh, kind of, and so if you look at, this is even within a species, you have a shift in the way the birds live their lives. So if they're at high elevation, like in the upper left, the junco, and the savannah sparrow, the horned lark, and the ptarmigan, they're in a, a system where they live longer, but have lower fecundity. Um, so the vertical axis is survival and the horizontal is fecundity. And we compare that to the lower elevation um, where the juncos and the uh, savannah sparrows at lower elevation and the um, Pacific wrens have a sort of a short, fast lifestyle. So they don't live as long, but they produce more. And uh, the wrens did not do well at high elevation. So for the wrens, it looks like uh, the area which was Cypress and Seymour uh, above uh, tree line, uh, this seemed to be a suboptimal habitat for them. They did better at lower elevation. So not everybody that's up there uh, is uh, there because they want to be, but many, most of them are. Now, I want to move to another aspect of uh, use of uh, avian use of high elevation habitats, and that's during uh, migration stopover. So this is another uh, aspect of, of biodiversity that hasn't been given very much attention. But from hiking in uh, the mountains in late summer, early fall, you will probably, if you're a bird watcher, you'll have probably have seen uh, a number of birds and certainly birds that you know don't breed there. And that's because numbers of birds move upslope in late summer to characterize, to ca capitalize on the flush of flowers and insects. And one of the better known species to do this is the Rufus hummingbird. And they move up in late summer and actually set up territories and defend flowers, uh, sort of uh, patches of flowers in late summer after they've finished breeding at lower elevation and then uh, before they uh, migrate to South America. So this is one species that does this routinely. And when we were working on ptarmigan on Vancouver Island and walking up to the Alpine, we noticed a whole lot of other species that we were very surprised to see at that elevation. So I set up a study where I looked at 10 mountains in central and, and central British Columbia and uh, looked at what species were there mid-August to mid-October. And so I divided the habitat into uh, upper montane, so it's conifer forest that's not closed anymore, it's getting open, into the subalpine where it's basically tree line and then above the trees. And what we found for this period was that we found 95 uh, bird species from 30 families and uh, almost 20,000 individuals. So a really high, this is a, a meadow in, um, in um, Strathcona Provincial Park. And uh, overall, what we found was that a third of the birds that we know to be breeding in British Columbia use these mountain areas uh, in fall from August to October. 
So that was, uh, and this includes like the warblers and woodpeckers and uh, a variety of species that you wouldn't expect to be above tree line or at tree line. And uh, I'd also point out that this is a period of three months. So this is actually longer than the breeding season. So when you're talking about the biodiversity value of mountain areas, then uh, for, um, for this area, uh, the late summer um, period, it's kind of like a staging area or a migration stopover where they get to refuel is, uh, is pretty important um, for them to do. And what we found out in North America, that was the same for North America. And so just to give you an example of a few species like this Baird sandpiper that's m migrating um, south from the Arctic, it drops in on the Alpine just to sort of, it probably seems like a fairly similar, um, familiar habitat to it, and savannah sparrows. So we had a number of long distance migrants that stopped in these areas um, uh, during this uh, period in late summer. Uh, short distance migrants, the horned larks and uh, bluebirds, and uh, overall, uh, what we found was <clears throat> that we had 22 species that were long distance migrants. Uh, and the peak for those uh, were about mid August. Most of the species were short distance migrants, 43 species. And for this group, the density was quite a bit higher than it was for the long distance migrants. And that uh, area has just finished a little while ago. The peak for migration there was mid to late September. And then we had a few altitudinal migrants, or, which are species that breed at lower elevation, like the, the wren and uh, nuthatch, and chickadees. And when it's nice, they move up and then may stay there even for a day or so. And then they come down if conditions get rough. But so basically, they're just local altitudinal migrants. And then, of course, you have a few um, resident species as well. So those are the kinds of birds that you will see if you go hiking in the mountains in late, uh, in late summer. And why do they do this? Well, mostly they're going up for food. Um, at, low at, at that time of year in the lower mainland and uh, at low elevation, uh, the food's pretty much gone. And uh, at high elevation, uh, the flush of productivity of flowers and berries and insects uh, is, is high. And then once you've got um, all the small birds coming up, then you've got the predators coming up after them. After them. So it's basically the food web moves up the mountain in late summer and then stays up there until the snows drive them down again. Uh, so overall then, um, to look at uh, the use of mountain areas in North America, uh, this is the big picture. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of alpine breeders, we only have six obligate species, but almost 60 uh, species that breed across elevational areas. And some of these, for some of these species, their low elevation habitats are compromised or degraded or disappearing. So the higher elevation habitats are becoming more important for this group. Uh, if you count the migrants, as well as the breeders, just in the alpine, that's 158 species. And if you add all of the species, uh, the tally from high montane to alpine for both breeding and post-breeding, it's uh, the last time we counted, it was 244 species. And that's a third of uh, the species that um, uh, breed. This is for North, uh, sorry, that's North America. So this is um, that. So a third of the species that are known to breed in North America use mountain habitat. So it's basically the same as the tallies that we got when we were looking at uh, just for British Columbia. And uh, for many of these, the at the high elevation, there's little monitoring on any taxa, and that's it's mainly during the breeding season, whereas probably the focus should be on post-breeding because that's a, a pretty important uh, period as well. Another um, cause to uh, sort of raise the value of high mountain areas for, for conservation is that a quarter of these species are of conservation concern. So uh, it's not just that we have high biodiversity, but these are uh, species of concern. Uh, and so these can be considered uh, uh, the, to have maybe a refugium kind of role for these species. 
of course, lots of things are happening uh, in um, in terms of habitat um, and conservation concerns. And I'm not going to go into this very deeply, um, but uh, just some of the conservation, uh, the climate change impacts uh, uh, for mountain habitats. And of course, there's a couple of different kinds. I've been interested in the short term uh, sort of environmental variability uh, in terms of um, the frequency and severity of extreme weather events and how birds can cope with that. Uh, but there are also another concern, a big concern is the increases in minimum temperatures in winter. And then the longer term concerns are the rising tree and shrub lines, as well as habitat loss and smaller patches. And even in the last 25 years or so where we have um, uh, data for air photos, there's considerable infilling, especially on Vancouver Island, uh, of um, subalpine areas or uh, rising uh, tree line and, and shrub lines in uh, the Yukon. So these, these <clears throat> um, processes are happening. Now, of course, there can be other things like avalanches and fires that may chase the tree line down again. But overall, probably the future involves um, more uh, smaller patches. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that is uh, of major concern in all mountain areas <clears throat> can be represented by this glacier finch. Uh, glacier finches, which I said before, were formerly named the white-winged duica. Uh, these birds nest there. They're, they're strongly associated with glaciers. And uh, it's not, we don't know for sure if they're obligate, but these birds nest on vertical uh, ice faces and deep within crevasses, both for nesting and roosting, uh, which of course makes them very difficult to study <laughs> when you have uh, <clears throat> have to get up above 5,000 meters because they nest from 4,000 to meters to 5,300 meters. And then you have to try and scale uh, a glacier. And then, of course, for the most part, you wouldn't actually be able to get to the nest. Uh, so these birds appear to be associated with glaciers and then in the Andes. And then all of the Andean glaciers are melting and melting rapidly. <clears throat> so um, especially for the cold associated uh, birds and particularly any bird that's associated with glaciers is probably gonna have, um, well, they are having, uh, their habitat is shrinking. And, uh, and in some cases, these ice caps are disappearing. So overall, I just want to wrap up with uh, just uh, some general points about why high mountain areas are globally significant for birds. And first of all, that 12% of all birds uh, breed in the Alpine, so that's globally. And many of these are endemic species. They uh, breed only in the Alpine or they're of conservation concern. I mean, I'll point out that the tally is is a, a minimal minimum one because there are many areas, particularly in the Eurasian mountains, where and there's there really isn't uh, very much information at all, or if there is information, it's not accessible in uh, uh, in the English uh, literature. Uh, mountain habitats uh, represent twenty five percent of the global land surface, but they harbor about 50% of the terrestrial biodiversity hotspots. So because of the endemism and because of the biodiversity hotspots, uh, mountains pull well above their weight in terms of biodiversity. And of course, the threats uh, are climate change, uh, and it depends where you are, how significant that is. In certain areas, particularly in Europe, there's and in uh, South America, there can be extensive land use change or land use conversion uh, that isn't uh, compatible with, um, that results in habitat degradation. And overall, there's a really low state of knowledge of status, trends, and mitigation measures. When we were working on the book, it was, uh, very challenging to find out even the distribution of uh, species. For these 1,300 species, we might only have a third of them for which we even know, uh, even have any uh, record of nesting. So really, really basic things. And then, of course, even less information about uh, mitigation measures uh, should we determine that the birds are uh, in trouble. 
And I think, uh, oh yeah, I'll end up with some acknowledgements. This represents uh, probably 30 years of research, maybe 40, I've forgotten to, the tally. Anyway, many graduate students were involved um, and many field workers and I had a range of funding over the years from, um, from government, uh, from universities and government, the province and uh, environment and climate change Canada. <clears throat> And as Colin mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have my pandemic project was to put all this information on both the research that I've been doing for uh, 40 plus years, as well as uh, others who have also um, been studying. And then we spent a lot of time just working with new authors to get um, to see what we could do to uh, close some of the data gaps. And this book just came out. Um, uh, a month ago or so. And uh, there's a number of ways you can get a copy if you want. There's <laughs> there's a few copies in the UBC bookstore, or you can contact me as well, and I can give you the information. And uh, thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. That is very, very informative because I know virtually nothing about the alpine birds. I was one of the one of the many, many things I was surprised at is a, a, a bird that like the Pacific Grand, which I associate as very low elevation and hidden in the in the undergrowth, uh, would be one of the high elevation birds. So that's uh, I found it fascinating. So I mean, thank you very, very much for taking the time to help educate and entertain us. It was. Uh, it's, I guess a lot of work, many, many years of work to compile that information. And uh, uh, we just get to sit back and enjoy the, the fruits of your labor all those years. So we can open it up to uh, to questions now. If you want to ask a question, I guess, Denise, you can unmute anybody that wants to. Uh, they can unmute hey, themselves. If you have a question, put it in the chat, or you can uh, unmute yourself and speak up. Should I stop screen sharing? Uh, sure. Uh, I have a question. I uh, just wanted to ask if um, you've noticed any interesting um, evolutionary changes that might not have been found before or anything that's um, you found fascinating? Well, <clears throat> there are, it's hard to know, uh, it's hard to really get a strong handle on evolutionary changes because we don't know what it was before it even started. So in other words, there's no reference condition, no timeline, but there are some very interesting, there's some very interesting work being done on the high elevation hemoglobin for uh, for hummingbirds and for other bird species, where they they have evolved genetic um, adaptations, certain alleles that allow for more efficient oxygen transfer, and and then some of the birds, uh, say in ptarmigan, the birds at high elevation have higher density um, hemoglobin and higher function in terms of cytosine, so higher oxygen capture. Uh, adaptations. So there's a bunch of, uh, there's a number of biochemical and physiological adaptations that allow them uh, and the eggs. The, bi the big challenge uh, is are the eggs because they, they don't really have a lung, but they have to have oxygen has to go into the egg. And so <clears throat> this is a problem when the oxygen levels are lower. So there's less diffusion into the egg. But the embryo has developed um, <clears throat> certain enzymes that allows that to more efficiently capture what does go in. So yeah, there are definitely uh, high, ele high elevation alleles that are mostly related to more efficient oxygen capture, <clears throat> which is quite interesting. Thank you. I see uh, Jennifer Getzinger asked, do any of the birds lay more than one clutch of eggs per season? And the answer is yes. Uh, the birds, uh, most of the birds will lay only one brood or one clutch per season, but if they fail, if a predator gets it or 
and the occasional uh, time the eggs will freeze. So I mentioned that the, the horned larks start as early as possible there, like a, the ground is mostly barely snow free. The savannah sparrows are significantly, so a horned lark weighs about 35 grams, 30, 35 grams, and the savannah sparrow is only 18 grams. So it has to sacrifice 25% of its season. It has to wait another two weeks after the horned lark start uh, before it can go. Otherwise, its eggs freeze. So once in a while, they make a mistake and they start <laughs> because the season is so short and then they fail. So they will, they will replace, they will lay another clutch. And occasionally, if it's, a, if it's an early year, so the snow goes more quickly, horned larks will actually get two broods. Uh, will have enough time for two broods, but mostly it's just one. And, but occasionally they lay a second clutch because they've lost the first one. <clears throat> and uh, someone asked what is meant by obligate, and that means they are uh, required. They, they're not flexible, so they don't have a choice. They have to either nest in that area or nest in a tree cavity or whatever so they so that's so the the terms are obligate meaning required or facultative meaning you can do one thing or another and there will still be new birds to be found if you <laughs> so when i say 1310 that was the tally uh, that was very, uh, was my uh, student, Devin um, <clears throat> uh, Deswan, who uh, worked with a dozen or 15 authors, I guess, from all the continents and did what he could to try and figure out for numbers of species. You know, are, do they breed in the alpine or not? Is there, what are the, what's the information? So um, <clears throat> uh, that others will be found and there will be new species because in the, in the tropics, uh, especially in the Himalayas, there's sometimes a gradation where you go with maybe four or five species in one genus and one will be lower elevation, next one will be a little higher and the next one will be a little higher. And some of these are not very different just to look at them, but they may ha they have different behaviors. So those kind of what we call cryptic species, we certainly will find more of those. Now, John Martin raised his hand. So, oh, and then I see another hand oh. raised. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, and, and thank you for for this evening. It's it's fascinating. Uh, I'm wondering if there was any um, fl flight is such an important part of, of of activity for birds. I'm wondering if there was any differences in uh, adaptations related to flight that uh, that showed up with uh, you know high mountainous al alpine birds versus the the lower ones, or are they essentially the the same? Uh, well, there's a variety, yes, there's a variety of different ways that, uh, uh, for example, some birds uh, do something where they walk uphill and fly down just to save energy. So there's a lot. So there's that. Um, I'm just trying to think of uh, four body size. Um, the, 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 um, the shape of the wing will be more related to uh, the the type of hunting. Uh, so that's not necessarily something that changes with uh, elevation. The, the wings can be a little longer and, uh, and a bit more pointed. That probably helps them maneuver in the wind. So yeah, there are, there are uh, yes, that's true. There are a little bit longer, but that, that varies from uh, across different species, different families related to whether they are, are seed eaters or predators or insectivores, because that will influence the kind of uh, uh, shape they have both off the body and the wings. Thank uh, you. Is, uh, there's, uh, I'll go with Gail New. Is there any difference in the raising of young in species that live at multiple uh, elevations? Yes, there is, and it's uh, we don't know very much about it, but one of the, the things that I found, I had a student working, um, basically the difference is that uh, when you have, for the same species, nesting at high and low elevation, so joncos, horned larks, uh, they take longer 
at high elevation. So they'll take four days, two days longer in the egg. So from when they lay, when they start incubating, it takes two days more, and then it takes four days longer uh, in the nest for nestlings. So that's six days that is potentially a really difficult period because uh, all of that time, it's extra time when the predators could detect them and therefore lose the whole thing. But the one of the benefits of nesting in the alpine is that the predation rates are lower. And, and the other very interesting thing for these juncos, it was amazing, like they take four extra days. They only take six days, six or seven days at low elevation, like say a thousand meters or lower on the same mountain and higher up, it'll take um, say 10 or 11, 12 days. But when they leave, those, those adults are big, those chicks are bigger. So again, it's the fewer, fatter, larger offspring uh, in the high elevation, which is then probably a big advantage in terms of them surviving longer uh, into adulthood. So it's just a slow lifestyle uh, where you have multiple years to get the job done of replacing yourself as opposed to lower elevation where you have to be faster because you don't have as many years. So that's now it's difficult to, to get that information <laughs> takes quite a few years. You need to have a multi-year study. And then, uh, you know, even when I have 10 years or 12 years, you get some weirdo year, you get a year when you have almost nothing happens or something different happens. And so it takes, it takes seven or eight years to even get that trend uh, and be sure that it's, it's a robust trend. But overall, that appears to be the, the pattern. Uh, oh yeah, have I anything interesting I've uh, discovered about Clark's nutcrackers? Now, uh, Clark's nutcrackers are a really interesting species, <laughs> but they're very difficult to work on because they breed in February and they're really low density. So you have to be extremely tough uh, to, to work on them. There has been some work done in the US on them. Um, and they have low um, low density, and uh, you have to spend a lot, cover a lot of miles on snowshoes to get uh, very much. So I I'm just trying to remember uh, any sort of they, the all these species have some nugget of something that they do differently or more weirdly. You now, Clark's nutcrackers are good for planting trees, especially uh, white pine uh, and. Um, uh, and um, what's the other, not the pine, what's the alpine, the, the tree level pine? Uh, limber pine? No, it's not limber. Um, bristlecone pine, bristlecone okay. pine. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and that relationship is a nice tight relationship, but uh, I haven't worked on them. I just admire them. And uh, does sunspot activity influence bird migrations? Uh, possibly, but I don't know anything about that whatsoever. So uh, uh, what food is available for very early nesters? Well, it's amazing. The alpine, despite its rigor, it has quite a lot and it would have a lot of seeds uh, and the windblown areas would provide seeds. And then there's... Um, sort of larvae and uh, and then the other thing for uh, even for robins and for horned larks is you get in the spring you get this um, sort of winds that blow up uh, aeolian winds that blow up insects and uh, seeds and that onto the snow and uh, then because they're mostly dark uh, then the, the snow uh, melts a bit around that and a lot of birds in spring use these. They feed really productively. And on Hudson Bay Mountain, where we work, robins would fly up from the trees and feed on these uh, snow fields that had this uh, food that was blowing up, blown up. So that's a, a nice little food source for, uh, particularly for birds that are uh, foraging um, sort of very, uh, sort of uh, intensely to so that they can lay eggs. Did somebody else have their hand up? They just showed if I'm missing you. 
so what is the, are there differences in the insulation or density of feathers of the early nesters? That's a great question. And we actually worked on that. My student, Devin, worked on that for juncos. And the high elevation birds have just more plumules, like more, uh, you know, like the feathers are have these ratchets that put together and then sort of long downy like um, uh, plumes at the base of the feather. And they, they do have more densely, um, the feathers have better insulation, the higher elevation birds. And they also have uh, a more faded, the pigment in the feathers is such that it reduces some of the ultraviolet ra um, radiation. Cause that's one of the things that's uh, an issue for birds is the, in, at, in the high elevation, high alpine, the UV ray, rays are very strong and they can sort of break down the feathers. The feathers are a very beautifully put together structure that needs to be quite strong to be used for flight. And so you don't want the feather breaking down before the end of the season, before the end of the breeding season. So, so yeah, the, the, there's a, the color has something to do with um, minimizing the damage done by UV. <clears throat> Uh, is drone use widespread for data collection? And are there any new technologies that are being used to help on that front? Um, we have not used drones, but for sure drones are really useful. If you want to look at habitat quality at a slightly larger scale than what we do, which is kind of around the nest and then a little bit away from the nest, then some aspects of habitat quality could be used, um, characterized uh, by using drones. So for sure, the, the people working on plants uh, can use that very effectively. Um, we fantasized about using drones to look in cavities, uh, a tree of, you know, sort of cavity nesting woodpeckers and other species by sending, because some of these uh, habit, some of these cavities are, 20 meters up or more, and we can only get up about 15 meters. And uh, so we thought it would be lovely to have a drone that you could just sort of poke in the hole uh, of the cavity and take a picture or whatever, but we we haven't got there on that one. Um, <clears throat> and new technologies, well, some of the new technologies are uh, sort of heat seeking, uh, things that would measure uh, temperature and uh, for heat stress, particularly in Europe where um, the snow fields are getting smaller and some of the cold associated birds are really challenged by these later summers. So you need you need to have for for ptarmigan and for number of species, you need you, it needs to be cool. Cool is a little better than warm. And the worst is you can when the snow fields melt extensively, then you're sitting along the snow field because it's cooler and a predator, an avian predator is going to have a lot easier time to find you. So there's there's um, there's some um, sort of heat measuring devices that can be used for for that. And of course, uh, I didn't talk about this. I had to really reduce what I, but we've used geolocators to look at where the birds, uh, the horned larks go in late summer. And uh, like after they leave the breeding site, where they go, where they winter, because one of the things is if we have these birds that are nesting both high and low elevation, sometimes on the same mountain, well, where do each of them go? And if, if they're differentiating, if they're larger and they have a different life history, then they probably have to go to a different place so there's not so much mixing. So my student Devin looked at that with geolocators as to see where the, the larks went. And they, they go to the coast and then they go down. Um, they went actually to central Washington and southern Washington and Idaho and then spent the winter there and then came up. And then one of the things we found that was extremely interesting, and I, I talked about stopover areas during migration in the fall, but the horned larks come up and they hang out in the Kamloops area um, in that area for about a month before they go to the breeding site. And so, and there's a possibility that rusty blackbirds do the same. So this is a completely, um, and so we haven't been able to uh, pursue that study, but if we have a number of Northern birds and high elevation birds who leave the breeding site 
or the, leave the winter site at the same time as other migrating birds, but they can't go to their breeding site because the breeding site is a month later than uh, say a low elevation bird. And so what they do is they seem to go, you know, part way or, you know, few hundred kilometers south and hang out there and then arrive on the breeding site when it's uh, remotely reasonable to start breeding. So if these areas now for the larks, they were using kind of grasslands. And uh, as far as we could tell, like we weren't able to get uh, very, you know, we weren't able to actually see the birds or, but we were able to do within 50 kilometers uh, using these geolocators. And um, so that's a very interesting part of migration. Uh, so spring stopover areas, just like say the geese do or the waterfowl. So um, that's something that would be very interesting to know about. Um, um, and we don't know how, well, how many other species do it, but we have it nicely uh, documented for the horned larks that say we're breeding in the Hudson Bay area and Smithers. Um, are there known differences in songs and communication? Oh, great questions. Wow. Uh, John Martin, I wonder if you're my cousin. <laughs> anyway, uh, are there known differences in the songs and communication for birds in higher elevations? And is uh, does this elevation impact any of this? Um, so there's a couple of things there. Uh, the the uh, habitat really uh, attenuates or influences the song. So you can have the same song, but if it's uh, distributed in a forest versus alpine, it's going to sound different. And then, of course, there is the wind that will be ever present at uh, above treeline. And so uh, there is the possibility. Uh, some people think they do have uh, different um, communication, like different, the song is different, but I don't, I think for the most part, they may use a different song, like off their repertoire, which most of them will have a repertoire of multiple songs. And so in certain conditions, they will use a particular song or a piece of a song that would be, would have better distribution under um, inclement conditions. So, um, there's a number of studies. There's pipits in Italy, I think, where somebody has suggested that the there are song differences there between higher and lower elevation. But uh, as a general principle, I would say, you know, it's not been well studied and there's some evidence it might be a little different, but the habitat has huge influence. And um, did I miss anybody's? Uh, question? No, you got them all. Oh, good. Okay. I was trying to go. Good. Well, good questions. <laughs> it's very interesting. One of the things that the Alpine, uh, I mean, the years are so different from one year to the other. So you kind of have... You might, after three or four years, you may think you have figured it out, and then there'll be a weirdo year where uh, in Colorado, I had three or four years, and then one year, uh, half the birds were bigamous. So they all, like half them had, uh, you know, two females. And, uh, and then there were a number of males that had none. And then another year, it was very strange, uh, everybody settled and it looked like it was going to be a regular old year. And then about 25% of the hens just took off a day or two before they started laying their nest and went off to another mountain, uh, which was a huge problem. <laughs> we spent the whole summer trying to find them. And no, uh, no uh, these were birds. Some of them had nested on that territory a couple of years and they just went off. Some of them, when we backdated, it had to be the day before they started their first egg when they would be very fat because they gain 25% of their body mass just before they start laying. So uh, who knows, it never happened again, or maybe one bird once in a while, but that year, and then were three or four study areas we were working on happened on all the study areas. So, you know, they do weird things and uh, that's what makes it interesting.
When looking for birds at high elevation, where should one look? Well, uh, it depends on the season. Uh, in uh, the fall, you can get these, in some cases, 10 species flocks. So they flocking and so you can have nothing and then all of a sudden you'll have uh, you know, a huge number of birds come through. Um, I think the best thing to do is uh, for for looking for birds is to just sit quietly in a place that's uh, uh, a um, you know a good observation place, or just walk well off the trail if it's reasonable, and um, and then as I say, a, a time that's very good usually well early morning, and also if it's foggy, uh, that really tends to get the birds more. Uh, excited about, or they just feel safer in terms of moving around or calling. Yeah, I have one question, Kathy. I'm not sure how to put it into, it would take me too long to type it in, but I'm just wondering about the, the mating strategies of birds because when you're wide open and you're trying to impress a female bird, you're far more likely to be predated so I'm wondering if there's maybe a lower density of, of, of raptors up there, birds of prey that they don't have to worry about uh, as, as we do down at the lower elevations because they're... Uh... Um, well, for one thing, they um, most of the birds have extremely good vision and they see a raptor long before you do. Uh, and then they respond appropriately to, you know, getting crouching down or just stop moving. Like for a raptor, for uh, for a, a an avian predator, the best thing you can do is freeze, and just not move. If you're if it's a mammalian predator, well then you're going to they're going to be scenting, they're going to be tracking you, they're going to sense. So then you again, it's a good idea to to lie low, but you have to be prepared to be ambushed by so you you know you'd have to be you could you can move away or you can fly away which helps a lot for a bird on the ground but uh, many alpine birds don't want to take to the air they that third dimension they see is quite dangerous especially bigger birds like ptarmigan they don't fly unless they have to or unless it's a uh, cloudy day and, but they're very good at seeing predator, uh, mammalian. In fact, if you're watching birds, which we have done a lot, uh, you can see, um, they see the, the, the predator long before you do. Does there tend to be a lower density of birds of prey higher up? I have no yeah. idea. Yeah, I think it would be. And then the density of birds per se, like so for most alpine bird species, the densities are relatively low. And then overall, um, the density, even with accounting for all the species, the densities would be fairly low. And then the other thing that makes a huge difference is the alternate prey. So if you're on a mountain with a bunch of um, marmots or ground squirrels or something else, well, then the profitability of going after a fairly small bird is much lower. So it helps if you've got some mammals uh, on the study area, because that means the pressure on, uh, you know, bird X is, is lower. Thanks. Mm. Well, what do you think, Denis? It's uh, 8.49 now, and I think most questions have been put into the chat, so. You've asked lots of really interesting questions. It's been a while since I've had such a range of, uh, of good questions, so it's, um, it's been a pleasure. It's been, well, been a good evening. It's been probably the, 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 the questions are because it's such an interesting subject that most of us aren't familiar with. So we, mm -hmm. you give us a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much, Dr. Martin. All right. Well, good night, everybody. I'll uh, end the meeting now. Okay. Thank okay, you very well, much.